Good morning. <clears throat> How are we all doing today? This first Sunday of 2014. I'm glad you're here. I'm almost not here. Um, I got sick Christmas night and went to bed, and I have been vilely sick for the last two weeks. So, uh, and if I start coughing, I have a microphone prepared here, so you don't, I don't have to cough into your ear. But just, I would really appreciate it if you'd pray for me. I do have a message I believe God's put on my heart, and I want to get it out, <laughs> but um, we'll see how t this morning goes. Uh, how many of you do reviews <clears throat> at the end of the year? You look back over the, the last year and uh, think about what God did in that year, and then also kind of look forward to the next year. Can I just see your hands? I really encourage this. Uh, this is the first Sunday of January two, of 2014, and um, I've been doing some reviewing, and there's lots of things to look back on. You know, what's God done in your life in 2013? How have your relationships been? Um, have you grown in the Lord? And if you've been in our church for a, uh, for a while, uh, at the end of every year and at the beginning of every year, I encourage you to go online to our website, opendoor.tv, and there's a survey you can take called Next Step Survey. And some of you have, haven't thought about that for a whole year, but I encourage you to do this every year. Go to the Next Step Survey and answer those questions, and it just gives you a snapshot of where you are and your growth. How are you growing in the Lord? Are you becoming more like Christ, and in, in what ways? And um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a fantastic way to monitor what God's doing in your life and then kind of compare that over the last year. How much have I grown over the past year? Because uh, we all want to grow in the Lord, right? Yeah. Amen, Pastor. We all want to grow in the Lord. So this is a good time to look back, but not just spiritual growth. You know, how are things going in your, in your marriage, in your family? You know, um, look at some of the areas, the goals in your life, and just review. It's, it's the unexamined life is not worth living. So take the time to do that. And uh, as I've done that, <clears throat> Um, I, I even began to review my, my sermons, and I noticed something that I thought was kind of interesting. Over, the, over 2013, and if, if you've been paying attention, maybe you've already seen this, um, there was a, a, a theme that <laughs> ran through the whole, whole year that I, um, I wasn't aware of how much I had talked about this theme. And the theme <clears throat> is trials. T uh, hard times, crisis, times that are difficult to get into our lives. And um, you know, I preached a whole series called Hope in Hard Times and Hope in the Midst of Crisis, Hope in the Midst of Loss. And then, then we uh, went into a life of David. And remember, we, we kept seeing in the life of David all these difficult times and hard times and how God used those hard times to shape him and how God used those difficult times to, to teach him to be dependent. And so many of the great psalms that we love came out of difficulty in David's life. He didn't write some of the most loved psalms when things were going perfect. <clears throat> he, he wrote them when things were going bad and he was scared and confused and times were hard. And we saw that in life, David's life. And then we went into the psalms like we do almost every summer and saw again a lot of these themes of David and going through trials and how God would help us. And, um, you know, we did that one sermon called Trouble. Many of you remember that because uh, Taylor Swift made a guest appearance that Sunday. Oh, you missed that Sunday. So, sorry about that. Um, you know, we, we uh, kept looking at these different Psalms and we, a uh, sermon when, when God says no and how disappointing that is. When God says no, it's because He has a greater yes for us. And, there's just all these things we learned. <laughs> then in the fall, we started a new series uh, going into the book of James. In the very book, beginning of James, James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of many kinds. And so we started plowing through James chapter 1 and saw how God uses the trials of life to grow wisdom in us. And how God uses the trials and the hard times of life to mature us and to make us more like Christ. And we talked about how we might be open to what God's doing in the midst of trials. And we talked about how temptation in every trial, 
in every test there is lurking a temptation. Remember this? And how we want to be open to see what that temptation might be. And, and um, as I look back, I was like, oh my, I didn't plan on preaching that much about trials. Um, <clears throat> but I got a lot of feedback over the year that that was really helpful to people. Um, you know, I did plan in 2012 what I would preach in 2013, but I didn't set out to go, okay, I'm going to preach, you know, 85% of my sermon is going to be about trials. Uh, and, um, but it looks like a lot of that was. So um, I got to think in all the different angles that we looked at trials and, and hardships and the things we've learned. And I discovered there was one angle that we really never um, addressed and uh, that angle is what is the effect on trials in our life on our relationships. Now we talked about how, <laughs> about how our relationship, relationships sometimes bring up trials. It's because of our relationship with our spouse or because of the relationship with our children or because of the relationship at work or, or a friend. That's what drags us into trials or brings us into hard times, no doubt about it. But this new angle is, is when things are going well in my relationships and or maybe a primary relationship and then I go through this trial and it just drags on. Maybe it's a physical trial. I'm sick or my spouse is sick and it just goes on or my child or if it's a financial difficulty or, you know, and you go through this and after a while it begins to wear on your relationships and next thing you know you're having major relational conflict with the person you know best or love best or you don't usually have relational conflict with and you're like, oh, what happened? Tell me, some, has this ever happened to you? Please sh shake your head, yes, even if you have to lie to me. Just kidding. Um, I, I see this happening all the time. And what makes it so insidious is we're so focused on the trial and, you know, honoring God in the trial or getting through the trial or just surviving the difficulty that we're going through that we don't pay attention to our relationships and the next thing you know, we're having a fight. We're, we're, we're in a big turmoil with our spouse or our best friend. It's nice when those are the same thing or a, a person that we've known for so long and we've never had conflict with and all of a sudden we have this. And what James, this great wise pastor, this great wise counselor wants to say to us, and you can write this down, is that when trials come, pay attention to your relationships. If I was gonna summarize what I wanna say today, that's I think what James is saying when trials come, don't be so focused on the trial that you miss, that you're not paying attention to what's happening in your relationships. Pay attention to those because every trial is a breeding ground for major relational conflict. And again, it doesn't have to be a trial that's relational in nature. It just wears you down. It's amazing how many times people get divorced after a long-term health issue with a child, especially if that, that, that child's long-term health issue ends in death. It is scary how many times after one of those long ordeals, husband and wife come back together and they don't come back together and they end up getting a divorce. It's alarming. And uh, other kinds of long-term trials, we don't realize the effect on our relationships. And next thing you know, we've, we've gone apart. This has happened to me over the years and uh, different times. Uh, you know, I'll be focused on this issue or this challenge. And I've got other people on my team or in my family. And, and you know, together we're focused on this and we give our best effort to it. And uh, next thing you know, we're having major relational conflict. And I'm like, where did this come from? And over the years, I began to realize, dude, pay attention to your relationships in the midst of conflict. And if I had, if I had just heard that from James earlier, which is what I want to help you see today, it would have saved me some pain. So turn to James chapter 1. 
again, man, James is the brother of Jesus and he has such wisdom and wow, is this great wisdom for us today. James chapter 1. Let's stand to read God's word, to honor his word. Just a couple verses, 19, 20, 21 of James chapter 1. <clears throat> Listen to James. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this or pay attention to this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. All right, let's, let's be seated. All of us, myself included. If you've... Um, been with us to the book of James, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, it starts off talking about trials. And I keep telling you this over the years, the most important rule in, in interpreting the Bible, well, one of the most important rules is, what does the context say? Well, the, the context of James chapter 1 is trials. And even though in your Bible, and check to make sure this is true, there's a break between verses 18 and 19. Is that true? Look down at your Bible. You do have your Bibles open, right? Isn't there a break between verses 18 and 20, 18, 18 and 19? That doesn't mean that James is done talking about the trials that he's been talking about in, starting in verse 2. He's still talking about that. Don't forget that. And in the midst of the trials, he says, now, my dear brothers and sisters, um, pay attention to this. Watch out. You know, take special note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. And, um, and this whole idea of what James wants us to see is, is uh, this, this, this idea of listening. He, now, this is, this is uh, amazing to me because most psychologists today, most counselors, most social work helpers, they realize how important it is that husbands and wives listen to each other. How important it is that employees and employers listen to each other. How important it is that people who work as peers listen to each other. How important in all relationships listening is. James wants us to hear that listening will help any relationship. And the ones that he's speaking about here are the brother and sister relationships, the, the relationships in the church. Now that includes relationships in the family because the families are in the church, but we can apply the wisdom that James has here to any relationship. It's not just Christians. That's who he's writing to, but this is not just for Christians. If you're, a, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, I'm here to tell you this wisdom that James gives us is just as applicable to you as it is to those of us who are following Jesus. But for all of us, pay attention, he says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen because listening will help our, our relationships. Now, how? How does that work? Um, the cover of your bulletin uh, uh, has a, a picture of an ear and the, what we're trying to communicate there is, the, you know, is like the science of listening. And you know, there are sound waves that go through the air and they hit your ear and uh, there's, a, um, there's a physiological study of how the ear interprets those waves to the brain and how all that works out. And there's a science to listening and, and there's things to be taught about just the the hard facts of listening and the science of listening. But, but wouldn't you agree, most listening is really needing to pay attention to the art of listening. Um, and you can do all the right scientific things and miss what's a, person's being, what a person is saying. It's, it's more than just words, as we'll, as we'll hear. Uh, and I want to launch this series in the next three weeks. Today we'll talk about listening to each other, the relationships we're in. Next week... James introduces that in verse 21, but in next week we'll dive into how to listen to God and specifically how to listen to God through his word. I'm really excited about next week. And then we'll finish up this series called The Art of Listening about, and talking about listening to love and that'll be the third week. So today, listening to each other, we want to improve in the science but the, and also most importantly the art of listening. And 
When we listen well, and we'll talk about how to do that, when we learn how to be quick to listen, that helps our relationship because listening communicates love. When I listen to you, I'm saying to you, you matter. You know, likewise, when you're talking and I'm looking somewhere else and, you know, you know, you know, texting on my phone or, or, you know, doing something else and obviously not paying attention to you, I'm communicating to you. You don't matter. I don't uh, see that you're important enough for me to give my attention to you. And very few of us want to say as we're texting while that person's talking, oh, I'm listening, you know, click, 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 click. You know, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sometimes when I'm talking to somebody and they start to text, I just stop talking and just wait and see how long it takes them to realize, oh, <laughs> he stopped talking. <laughs> because I think it's rude. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, I think it's rude why you're talking to someone for you to start texting or for them to start texting. I, that's just, you're not listening and you're communicating. You, you, I don't value you. And of course, when you want to say I love you to someone, you say that by saying, you matter, I value you, I honor you, I, I show by my words and my actions that you're a person of significance. You're a VIP in my life, I, I pay attention to you. Now, if you get an important phone call, just say, excuse me, you know, or can I take this text? But don't just do it, you know, because you're communicating, you don't, you don't matter to me. But listening, says, I, I love you, you're, you're important to me. I, I want to you to realize that you're a person of, of value in my life. And we want to understand. The people that we love, one of the ways we demonstrate love is we seek to understand, Stephen Covey taught us, more than we seek to be understood. If we're only seeking about being understood, then we're saying I'm a self-centered person. I'm more important than you. It's more important that you, that you understand me than I understand you. And of course, a lot of people live that way. But when someone listens to you, they're saying that you're important and that I want to understand you. Here's another thing that's so helpful. Listening helps us avoid the, the arguments that so easily crop up in day-to-day -day life. I don't know about those of you who are married, but... It's, it's amazing to me how many times my wife and I get into stupid arguments over little things. And when we are wise and mature, one of us will stop and go, whoa, 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 what, what are we arguing about? You know, how, where did this come from? This is not a big deal. It's because in the midst of some crisis or in the midst of some issue, we weren't paying attention to the relationship and we got caught up in interrupting or doing, not listening. And next thing you know, we're embroiled in an argument. And of course, one of the most, the, the quickest things we do when we get in arguments is we stop listening. <laughs> Frankly, friends, if we listened better in the middle of arguments, we would have a lot less arguments, right? The, one of the reasons we get into arguments is because we are uh, slow to listen. We stop listening. So James says, you know, be quick to listen. All right, what does that mean? I, I know it helps in my relationship. How do I do that? How do I practice being quick to listen? Um, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the original language to see a word. The word quick here is the word atakus, which we get our word takometer from. Those of you who are car buffs know a tachometer is that gauge on your dashboard that measures the RPMs of your engine, how, how, how many revolutions per minute. And, and if it's a low number, then you're, the, 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 the speed and the revolutions are slower. If it's a higher number and hopefully it doesn't get in the red, red zone, you know, you're in danger. It's, it's, over, it's speeding up. So what James is saying is increase the RPMs of your listening. You know, focus in, be dialed in, speed up the, the intensity of, you know, listening. So lean in, you know, perk your ears, be quick, get off the blocks fast, you know, to, and, and listen. Don't wait until the conversation has gotten to be intense and there's an argument and then you decide to listen. No, listen from the very beginning. Hit the accelerator, hit the listening accelerator from the very beginning and start into that conversation paying attention to what they're saying. Uh, paying attention to their words, 
paying attention to the words that they say, that's being attentive. That's what we call attentive listening. I'm, I'm paying attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth. I'm paying attention to the, the tone of that word. So paying attention to the words is not just, you know, uh, keeping a running dictionary for every word they use. No, I'm paying attention to the word they use and the tone that they use that word in. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he was re re relating how he was in a conversation with somebody and he said something and this other person responded back with anger. He, he could hear that on the phone because we can hear words and tones. We have the ability to do that. So amp up, listen to the tone, listen to the words and the tone that they're saying, but not just the words. Go beyond their words and this is, this is where the art of listening um, matters. Get into what their heart is saying. Ask yourself, this is what it means to be quick to listen, ask yourself, why did they use that phrase, those words? Why is that tone being used? Why is their body language, why are they doing that? And you know, you're, you can do this at the same time. This is not, not this is not, not listening. This is active listening. This is empathic listening where you're trying to enter in what they're feeling. That's what empathic means. I'm trying to enter in to their pathos, to their feeling. So I enter into their feeling by through the doorway of their words, their tone, their body language, you know, the, 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 the aura around them, you know, what's, what's happening here? I'm tuned in, I'm paying attention, and I'm doing this, you know, I'm quick to do this, and if you'll do this, you'll begin to realize, oh my goodness, this person's afraid about, or this person is really uh, anxious. Wow, I mean, I can just hear it in their words. And so you start asking yourself, what are they afraid about? What are they anxious about? Why are they being defensive? What, what's going on in their life, I wonder, that's causing them to react to me this way? Now, you can just blame them and say, you know, well, they're being a jerk, or you can enter into their pain, their fear, their anxiety. You can enter into what they're feeling, and when you do that, oh, man, a person feels understood. And you can tell when someone's listening to you and they get you, right? You, you can tell when they're not just listening to your words, but they're listening to your heart and they get you. And we like people like that. We, we love to talk with people who are looking us in the eye and, and listening to our heart and, and maybe asking a clarifying question. And they get us versus the people that you explain yourself again and again and again, and it's like they, they don't get you. They can even parrot back your words sometimes, but they're not hearing your heart. And it's almost like they don't want to. And so then they're communicating, you really don't matter that much to me. So that's why I call this, you know, hearing their words, their tone, their body language, hearing their heart. That's, you know, that's bringing understanding. That's love. I'm communicating by the way I'm listening, you, you matter to me. I, I, I love you. And I, th I think those are some of the things that it means to be quick to listen. And then James says, be slow to speak and slow to become angry. In the Greek, the slow to speak and slow to become angry are, are almost exact same constructions. James is trying to tell us something by the way he writes in the Greek language. These things go together. He, he's pairing them. So let's not separate them. Let's do like James says. Let's put these two eyes together. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. What, why should we be slow to speak and slow to be angry? Well, listening helps relationships, but anger man, anger devastates. Anger hurts relationships. Anger it's toxic to the health of a relationship. And when you amp up in anger, either by raising your voice or by you know, you know, getting really intense, people can sense that, it, it can hurt the relationship. And it doesn't have to, but it, most of the time it does. And here's why. Because when I get angry, I stop listening typically, and I talk too much, 
I say words that I, I wish I wouldn't have said. I'm, I'm quick to speak instead of being slow to speak. And there's a, there's the, the anger feeds off the words that I say and it kind of spirals. And I just like, the more I talk, the angrier I get. And, and you know, then that person that I'm talking to, they're not responding well to my anger. And it, then I get even angrier and it just escalates. And this is why we talk about blowing up and why a person just, you know, poof, what happened there? There's this relationship between being quick to speak and quick to anger and not listening. So James, his psychology here is brilliant. His insight into human nature is dead on. And of course, the Holy Spirit made us. The Holy Spirit is the best psychologist ever. He knows us inside out whenever the Holy Spirit is talking about relationships and psychology and, and the, the understanding of, of why, the way humans think and the way humans react and the way they relate. We should pay attention. God's word is wisdom in our relationships. And wow, is there wisdom here. Anger very rarely uh, accomplishes the purposes of God. Anger very rarely builds up a relationship. Anger almost always hurts, destroys, and sometimes devastates long-term ability to relate to each other. And as anger flows and as the words come tumbling out and you say things that you know you shouldn't be saying, it, whatever connection that you had, and that's, that's, what, that's what love is in relationship. It's connection. When you say you love somebody, and I'm not talking about just romance love. I'm talking about any brothers, and, and, you know, brothers of, who are walking with Christ together, sisters who are walking with Christ together. You know, the Bible talks about loving one another. What that is, it's a sense of connection. When you say, I love someone, and I feel loved by them, you're saying, I feel connected to her. I feel connected to him. She gets me. He gets me. Anger will cut away at that sense of connection. And it, it sometimes just cut, divides it, separates us. And, of course, that's the language we use for ultimate separation. And, and ultimate um, division between a man and a wife is divorce. They've, they're, they're separated. They're divorced. They've been cut off. The connection is cut off between them. So you can see how this works. And, and you know, show me a, a, a relationship that's headed towards divorce or show me a relationship that's in or has had a divorce and I'll show you anger somewhere. It not, may not be the explosive violent. It might be that seething, deep, bitter, long-term anger. And it's there. It's always there. It just shows up in different kinds of ways. It cuts off this connection. And then we say things that wound each other. This is what we do. And this is why anger is so dangerous. And being quick to speak is so dangerous. And that's why James says, be slow to speak. Because you can't take back those cutting hurtful words and we talk about you know the can't put toothpaste back into a toothpaste tube and the same way is when when one of those words come out oh you know that just cuts you you can apologize and you should but you probably won't in the midst of your anger but even if you do apologize can you ever completely heal that wound you can't you can ask them to forgive you but you can't heal their wound. And we'll talk about how we can get healed in, in a little bit. But um, friends, we all know that that old saying, sticks and stones may, may hurt my bones, but may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We all know that's foolishness, right? We all know that's foolishness, right? Okay. Some of the, uh, so there, has, there has been times when I wish somebody had punched me in the face because that wound will heal. But the things that they said to me just stay. They stay in the heart. They stay in the mind. They keep coming up. So it's these, this is why anger is so dangerous. It, it cuts off connection. It causes wounds. 
Let me talk about this one, next one for a second. Anger in relationships <clears throat> creates fear in the relationship. Now, go ahead and write that down, and then let me explain it. It's, I'm not talking primarily about the cowering that I'm afraid that when he gets angry, he's going to hit me. Now, unfortunately, that does happen in abusive relationships, and I, I hope that's not happening in your relationship. Uh, that's sinful, it's wrong, it's destructive, and it's another way that anger breaks, that tears apart relationships. And we all know that sometimes anger can lead to abusiveness, and it can lead to physical abusiveness. But oddly enough, that's not the, the fear I'm talking about, nor is it the fear that most people fear in a relationship that's spiraling down, in a relationship that's full of toxic anger. When you study relationships, one of the things that you find that's fascinating that, is, that few people recognize is um, that when a person gets angry um, uh, and they like shut down or they get manipulative or, you know, they practice self-hatred and, you know, play victim and tell you, there's all these little manipulative things that we do when we get angry. And when we do those things, um, our partner recognizes that and, and our partner will always lose. Let's, let's say, for example, if you are the kind of person that when you get into major conflict, you start saying, you know, what a terrible person you are. It's all my fault. And you blame yourself. And this always happens to me. And you, and you start, you know, doing the self-hatred thing. Um, that you, you may think of that as, you know, poor me. But for most of us, that's a defense mechanism that we go into to protect ourselves. Oh, we know exactly what we're doing. We're defending and we're doing that. That's our shell so you won't keep hammering me with your words. And what that does when you go into that defensive role is that creates guilt in the other person and they start feeling like, uh oh, they're going into the self-hatred thing or they're going into the victim thing. And it's like, I, once they go into that victim mentality, you know, I I, now I'm gonna lose, you know. You know, uh, uh, I got to be really, really careful here. <laughs> In the moments of anger, sometimes I have said to my wife, oh, go, go ahead and start crying. Because you know once you start crying, I, I lose. And I'm sorry that I, I, I said those things, but that's sometimes you say terrible things. I've said much worse, but, you know, I, I see her crying. And instead of being compassionate and gentle and going, I'm sorry, honey, uh, I go into sometimes the, um, oh, great, now you're crying, so this conversation's over. Because, you know, what kind of jerk is going to continue to to argue while his wife is crying? <laughs> sometimes this jerk, you know. Um, by God's grace, sometimes I'm not such a jerk, but, um, you know, and, and I was, I'm not accusing my wife of putting crying to manipulate at all. Um, but we, we all um, find ways that, um, that work for us. And when you're in a relationship with somebody who's manipulative and they, uh, they turn on the victimization mentality or they turn on one of these other guilt producing things, you sense that and you go, up. Oh, I just lost. It doesn't matter how where this relationship goes. And I fear that and so... It, a relationship that's full of anger and full of toxicity like that, that will begin to generate fear. And whenever you have fear in a relationship, oh boy, that's, you're in trouble. Now, there, there's fear lurking in almost all of our relationships. We respond and we react so much out of hidden fears. And one of the best things you can do to go to a counselor or to go to a spiritual director or, or ask the Holy Spirit, you know, all three of those things are great, or go to a counselor and ask the Holy Spirit, whatever, is to help you discover what, what are the fears that you have, fears of rejection, you know, of fears of conflict, you know, there's multiple fears. What are the fears that are at the base of your heart and that you tend to react out of? Because we all have them, and the more aware you are of them, the better you'll be relationally and the more healthier you'll be. Um, but we sense those, and, and anger creates those kinds of fears. Moms and dads, when you go off on your kid, you're setting into them a fear because they're so impressionable. Your angry outbursts matter 
Pay attention to those. And when you do that, apologize to your children. Say, you know, mom and dad, we, we don't want to be like that. We, I'm, I want to be a better dad. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm angry at what you did, but I shouldn't have said what I said. I'm disappointed in your disobedience, but I didn't handle that disappointment correctly. I'm sorry. I'm still going to discipline you, but... I need to ask you to forgive me for my outburst or for what I said, what, how I handled that. Um, and then ask God to heal that wound in them. There are so many of us walking around with wounds that we received from our parents that we've forgotten all about, but they are creating all kinds of fear in us. And, and of course, you can see where I'm going with this. It, it begins to, it breaks the trust really in a relationship. Angry words, angry actions cause me to go, whoa, not going there again with you. I, I don't, I don't trust you when you, get, when you don't get your way. When you don't get your way, you turn into this control freak and you say and you do things that I, I, ooh, 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 I, I, it scares me that I don't trust that. And that begins to break down the relationship. All these things that are happening. And it's interesting, James kind of wraps this all up by saying, verse 20, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. The word righteousness there is not referring to the standing I have before God. The word is used to refer to how I get along with people, how I relate, how I live my life. So uh, I'm not getting righteous. The only way I get righteous is by surrendering my life to Jesus Christ, repenting of my sin, and, and believing that Christ's death on the cross paid the penalty for my sin. And as I put my faith in Christ, I am made righteous. But once I'm made righteous in Christ, then I'm supposed to live righteous. And that means I'm supposed to live Christ-like. I'm supposed to love you, forgive you, be gracious to you. That's righteous living. And James is saying that when you, get, when you are quick to speak and quick to get angry, that does not produce the kind of righteous relating that God desires for you because this letter is written to Christians who have become righteous by Christ's death on the cross and now he wants us to live righteously but anger breaks up that righteousness and it blocks the vision, the purpose that God has for righteous relationships and that's loving unity. We love each other. We're one in Christ. The oneness that a husband and wife have and the oneness that the body of Christ has that's so important to Jesus and so important to God is broken in the midst of angry words and angry actions. That's why anger hurts relationships. And this is kind of a bummer of a sermon so far, isn't it? Wow. You know, so what, what do we do when we realize, wow, I've said things I wish I wouldn't have said. I've been the, I haven't been the best father or mother or spouse or friend in Wish I could take those words back. You can't. You can't take those words back. And as I said earlier, you can't heal the wounds you've caused in other people. Think about that next time you're running your mouth. You can't heal the wounds. But thank God, God can heal our relationships, the wounds that we cause, the wounds that have been done to us. Friends, this is good news. God heals relationships. Aren't you glad? Because I don't know about you, but I'm a sinner. I do know about you. You're a sinner. And we say and do things that are damaging and destructive, that are sinful. And thank God that he not only can forgive our sins, but he can heal us and heal the ones that we love that we've wounded and that we're so sorry for. How do we do that? Well, what's the very next phrase? Um, right after this righteousness that God desires, verse 21 says, therefore, key phrase, get rid. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. This is a beautiful word picture for repentance. This is not saying, I'm sorry, no matter how sincere you are. This is not saying, I'm sorry for saying that, and you should say you're sorry. This is bigger, this is deeper. When James uses this word, get rid of, it's this word that describes to you know, put off, to, to push away 
to turn away from. And that's our word, repentance. I turn away from that behavior. I, tur- I get rid of that way of, of acting. I, and the, the moral filth that's in my heart, you know, the, the lying, the, the self-protection, the self-centeredness, all those are moral things. I, I recognize that. I own that. And I say, God, I don't want to be like that. I get, I get rid of that in my life. I repent of that. I turn away from that. That's sinful. It's destructive. This is what James is saying. Own it. Apologize for it. Put it away. Get rid of it. Repent of your sin. And that's the first step towards you getting healed, and it's the first step towards healing happening in the relationships you in. And so you go to that person and you say, I'm so sorry for what I said. I'm sorry. I don't want to ever say that again. I don't ever want to do that again. And I'm, I'm repenting of that. I'm getting rid of that. By God's grace, I'm, I'm pushing that away, and, and I'm taking it off. I'm repenting of that. And, of course, the Bible teaches us when we own our sin like that, when we repent, then God rushes in with forgiving grace and healing grace. But as long as we say, well, you know, I did that because you were a jerk. If you hadn't have been so blah, 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 or if, if, I, you know, I, if I hadn't have been so tired, or if you hadn't been such for this crisis, if you had any idea how hard it's been for me the last year, if you had any idea how hurt and sick I am and, and you know, you're not repenting. You're, you're rationalizing your behavior. And that does not heal. And God will not bring healing grace into your life or your relationship as long as you're blaming someone else and as long as you're rationalizing your sin. But when you own it and say, I get rid of it, then there's the next thing. Uh, Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. And it is, friends. It's all around us. Um, and humbly... Except, I like the new American standard version of this verse. And humbly receive, that's that word. Humbly receive the word planted in you which can save you. Interesting phrase. Repent of your sin and receive God's word. Now, if you're looking at the screen in any of our venues, you'll notice I didn't capitalize the letter W on word. And the reason why is because it's not capitalized in my Bible. And I think it can refer to, it's a completely fair interpretation to to use this word to refer to the word of God, the Bible. But it's more than that. It's any word God says, not just the words that are inspired and written in the Bible, but the word of forgiveness that God speaks to your heart. Humbly receive that word of forgiveness. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sin and and to purify us from all unrighteousness, unrighteous living. Whether that word that God speaks to us is a word of conviction, receive it. It's a word of of rebuke, humbly receive it. A word of forgiveness, humbly receive it. A word of insight, humbly receive it. Don't just limit it to the written words of God. Let God speak into your life right now. God's speaking to you. Are you listening? Right now, are you humbly receiving God's word? Because I'm preaching God's word and God's faithful to speak through me and in spite of me. God is speaking right now. Are you listening? You're all in relationships. I'm in relationship. We all need this. Holy Spirit, speak to us in ways that we get and open our ears to receive your word. Because when we do, that can save us from ourselves. Save us, save us from destroying our relationships. Save us from tearing apart the very thing that we want to see healed. In in the Bible, the word save, sozo, also means healed. When God saves us, he, he makes us whole. He heals us, it's beautiful. 
So there's this healing, wholeness, salvation, deliverance thing that happens. And this is what James is saying. Humbly receive what God is saying to you, whether that's, again, a word of conviction, a word of rebuke, a word of forgiveness, a word of comfort, whatever God's speaking to you, humbly receive that into your life because that can heal you, that can save you, that can change you. And next week, we'll talk more about how do I do that? How do I receive God's word into my life? I cannot wait for next week. But for today, what's God saying to you? I want to close our service by inviting all of our venues to close your eyes with me. Close your eyes. And I want us to be real quiet and listen. James primarily has been talking about being quick to listen to each other. But behind that, there's also this be quick to listen to God. We're going to celebrate communion in just a couple seconds. It's going to be a perfect way for us to start the new year. It's going to be a perfect way for us to listen to the word of God that he's speaking to us right now. Because the Bible says by his stripes we are healed. By Jesus Christ's death on the cross, that's why we can be healed. So as we celebrate communion this is what we need, is the forgiveness that Jesus provides, the healing that Jesus provides. So Holy Spirit, sweep through our minds right now. As we quietly wait before you, we say, we want to be quick to listen. Think about 2013 things we've said and done. Think about this morning. Think about this past week. Lord, where do we need to be forgiven? Where do we need to go to a friend or a family member and apologize and repent? Lord, is there anyone here today listening to my voice who's never repented of their sin to you? Holy Spirit, speak that word into their heart. And may everyone humbly receive the word that God is planting in us right now. Friends, whoever can hear my voice, I believe the Holy Spirit speaking right now. He's going to speak a word of encouragement. He's going to speak a word of forgiveness. He's going to speak a word of rebuke. He's going to speak a word of conviction. He's going to speak a word of, of insight. God speaking. What is he saying to you? What is he saying to you? Stop thinking about what he's saying to your wife or your husband or your friend. What is he saying to you? And will you humbly accept, humbly receive the word that the Spirit is planting into your heart right now? Oh God, help us. This first Sunday of 2014, may we begin by humbly receiving the word you are speaking into our hearts. For I pray this in Jesus' holy name.